two and see. Oh, that is working. Okay, here we go. All right. Facebook, you disappoint me again. Um, no Facebook Live today. The cat's crying, wants to go outside because he hears the birds singing. It's just chaos. It's utter chaos. He doesn't hear the birds singing. He hears his breakfast. That was cold. That was cold, even for a sociopath. But, <laughs> um, folks, we're going to talk to you about something really interesting today, renewing the mind, the scout mindset. Um, and to set this up, I'll just share with you that we, Peyton and I and her mother, watched BJ and the Dirty Dragon on YouTube today. If, you, if you're not familiar with that, folks, you didn't grow up in the Chicagoland area and you're probably not over 50 but BJ and the Dirty Dragon was a, and the Giggle Snort Hotel later, was a children's show um, that was hosted by Bill Jacobs and a bunch of puppets and, and clay <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a fire-breathing dragon, or at least smoke-snorting smoke dragon, right? Yeah. Um, and it was a wonderful childhood growing up with BJ and the Dirty Dragon and with Ray Rayner and, yes, even with Bozo's Circus, which is all Chicago shows, right? Midwest, strong Midwest shows. And, um, and Peyton, 49 years later, this was a show from 72 I was showing her. My wife was just born, 1972. I was five. Uh, and Peyton was still 43 years in the future. Mm -hmm. Right, she was minus forty three. Uh, no, she was minus thirty eight. Minus thirty eight. So anyway, um, she enjoyed it, right? Did you enjoy? Yeah. What was your favorite part? I think it was when hmm, maybe when Mister Doomple um, tried to sprinkle the um. The magic dust on everybody to make them mean. Oh, so you like the dark, the dark <laughs> uh, part of the show. Um, did you like it better than the Wiggles? What's a Wiggle? The, that show, the Wiggles, the modern kid show, the Wiggles. Uh, if you've never seen it, you're better for it. Good. You're better for it. Okay, Good. the Wiggles sounds about as bad as it is. Why do I bring this up? Nostalgia? A little bit. A little bit. It, it was a great reflection. But I think something's happening right now in the church, which is, is to some people, it's scary and it's frightening. And this is the deconstruction of thousands and thousands of people who are leaving the church and going from affiliated as a Christian to affiliated as a nun. We're going to talk about that a little bit, the mindset. But what we're seeing happening today for sociologists who already know it and for Christians who who don't know it is um, a dynamic shift in thinking um, unlike anything we've seen since the 1960s and in the 60s of course you know there was a movement away from uh, the parents dynamic and w what was true in the 50s and and 60s children and young adults weighed what they had grown up with and they had found it wanting and so they tried to go off in different paths that brought them more meaning whether they succeeded or not is for another uh, show but that's the the attempt was an honorable attempt it was to make the world better um, through different areas now some of those areas tur uh, turned out to be detrimental I mean um, you might say the free love movement had very damaging effect uh, the uh, the indulgence of psychedelic drugs and so forth um, was a uh, you can you can go into these darker uh, corners where pragmatism ended up uh, crashing and burning however if you look at what's happening to our young people today it, it's hard to judge it as a negative thing yet they're they're not doing harming their bodies uh and i the question is are they harming their souls and we'll answer that right after this
So we're back. Peyton Cam's off today, but if I were to show you, she's working with clay. You want to hold up some lumps of clay so they know what you're working with? I Not don't have yellow or purple clay, but I'm, um, I mean orange, but I am mixing colors to make. That looks like colors. orange and purple. Yeah. Because oh, made you it. mixed it to yeah. get orange and purple. So this you have primary colors. Yeah. This is orange. Oh, smarty. Um, you could have pink there too if you hold up the white. But uh, so an article that appeared yesterday that I shared, and there's article after article, folks, that appears like this. Um, the the news from this article. Uh, for, to a website called Church Leaders is the biggest story in American religion is the unceasing rise of the nuns. The biggest story in American religion, March 10th, 2021, is the unceasing rise of the nuns. I want to just give you one figure from that, just a quick figure to let you understand. Oh, hey, Belle. Bella's got her chew toy. We're very proud of you, Belle. Um, I just share this, this paragraph. With due respect to the evangelical Christians who swayed Republican politics over the past 40 years, which was a pretty big story this year, you know, with the ending culminating in the what you have to say is the insurrection in Washington, D.C., but there's no bigger story in American religion than the persistent an unceasing rise of the nuns, defined as people who do not identify with any religious tradition. Now, some of these nuns are actually duns. They actually started in the Christian church and, and uh, chose exile. They chose to leave. Um, and then some of them have just grown up in homes that were not religiously affiliated and they they're comfortable in that tradition so people who do not identify with any religious tradition in 1972 just about one in 20 americans so the year that i was a five-year-old watching bj and dirty dragon this is to put it in perspective only one in 20 americans said that they were associated with no religion when asked by a pollster one in 20 that figure climbed to just uh, that figure climbed just two percentage points over the next twenty years. So by the time I was twenty five, from that point forward, so that's nineteen ninety two, if you're keeping track. From that point forward, however, the nuns enjoyed what venture capitalists like to call hockey stick growth. Um, in nineteen ninety six, just four years later, about twelve percent of Americans were nuns. So that's up uh, from 3% uh, in just four years, from 3% to 12% in just four years. Wow. Uh, by 2006, it was 16%. And in the latest data collected in 2018, we're three years later now, so it's uh, follow that hockey stick up. But in the latest data that we've collected in 2018, 24% of Americans had no religious affiliation, an increase of 50% in just 12 years. Now, to some people, this is an alarming matrix. And uh, to some people, to, to families uh, that you might say who have uh, had children, um, leave the church uh, and uh, go through all the trauma of, of coming out and and, uh, and and going through all that it's it's a startling fact I mean it, it's probably led to family um, turmoil maybe squabbling maybe alienation in, in some of the worst cases estrangement um, kind of like when a Orthodox Jewish uh, child chooses Christ. Um, it, it, we, we think that only happens in Fiddler on the Roof, where, where 
Uh, in some cases, they even have a funeral for the child who would betray their culture and choose Christ. Well, the, the Christian community we're finding from all the stories of deconstruction isn't terribly different uh, with how they treat their children who, who take their own path, walk their own path. And in some cases, um, in some cases, they have good reason to, uh, to walk away from something that's a toxic faith branded uh, some in, under some brand of Christianity. And so our, our, our channel, The Sparrow's Call, our ministry, The Sparrow's Call, is a ministry to these people who are going through this turmoil, who are going through de deconstruction, not just the individual who's rethinking their faith, but also those around them that, that should be loving them, <laughs> that should, should be walking with them and not judging them or shaming them or shunning them or slamming the door uh, after they leave, that kind of thing. So that's our ministry because it's, it's a phenomenon that Wendy and I were, became acquainted with years ago when we started to see this uh, data roll in and we actually saw it in our own church. We saw the young people not coming back and it wasn't unique to our church. It was something that was happening not just in America but lately in America, it had happened earlier in Europe and the UK and elsewhere, but it's happening now as a phenomenon in the United States. People don't know how to deal with it. And so we, I want to talk to you a little bit about that today and, and adjusting your mindset, both as parents and spiritual leaders, maybe you're a pastor or youth pastor trying to deal with this. And you've recognized that a lot of Christianity does it poorly. A lot of Christianity gets angry and defensive because they're insecure and their beliefs are built on fear and loathing and so they take the shame shun route you know this person's left the tribe well good riddance you know they were never really part of us anyway and th this kind of thing which just makes things worse and it actually makes the faith unattractive and it's hard to make jesus christ unattractive but christianity has done a good job of it over certain epochs and periods um to cloud the fact that as Tolkien said, God dying for his people is something, a story that every man wants to believe is true. You know, that kind of beautiful, redemptive story of self-sacrifice, um, that kind of unconditional love is something we all yearn for uh, in our hearts. This is what spoke to C.S. Lewis. This is what speaks to us all when we see stories of redemption and sacrifice from something like uh, the line, the witch in the wardrobe, is something that that really sneaks past the watchful dragons, like uh, the movie John Krasinski's movie A Quiet Place, which to me, by the way, if you haven't seen it and if you think it's a horror movie, rethink it. It's not, uh, although it might be uh, inserted into that genre uh, if you categorize movies. It's the greatest Mother's Day movie you've ever seen or you've ever not seen if you haven't seen it. So go watch A Quiet Place and you'll see a type of Christ in it, by the way. And maybe if you're a fan of The Office, you want to see it anyway, because Krasinski is that type of Christ. But um, go see A Quiet Place. Oh, only can't see it. Go uh, demand now or whatever, on demand, your, your A Quiet Place and see it. And, um, and let me know what you think of it. But so, so back to this study, I want to talk to you a little bit today about um, something that Julia, oh, this is maybe four or five years ago at Penn State University at a TED Talk. Julia Galliff, uh, my wife and I were watching this earlier in the week and we're very moved by it. And, and I said to Wendy, I said, you know, in many cases, people would be better off if you're, uh, if you're, you know, still... Uh, socially didn't sustain and not going to your local community church, people would be better off watching certain TED Talks than they are sitting under the typical evangelical pastor who just doesn't get it, which I think a lot of the Christian church in America just doesn't get it. And so we're, we're hemorrhaging right now because we've gotten distracted and took our eyes off of Christ. We really have. And, and as Richard Rohr says, the Western church in America has become like a new Caiaphas. They're like Caiaphas. We're, we're in bed with politics and we're trying to fight for a kingdom that Jesus didn't want us to fight for. We're fighting the wrong fight and not the right fight. And we actually think that, uh, that mortal messiahs can lead us into the kingdom. Um, but um, so I think a lot of people would be better off uh, maybe uh, 
just spending time on YouTube than spending time in church. This is a subject for another day, but this is why Church Without Walls is here. So you could, uh, you could have a bagel and cream cheese and a coffee in the comfort of your own home in pajamas and not have to play church to get a, you know, a second-rate message from, uh, f- from the typical evangelical pastor who, who do- who's trying to live in Mayberry and doesn't understand this generation. What's a cotton candy? Cotton candy. This looks like it would be a lot more calories than real cotton candy. But no, it might be healthier for you, actually, right? I don't know. It's but, clay, but... Uh, cotton candy, would would you be mad if I said it looks like a magic mushroom growing in a cool forest? Or even possibly an uh, ice cream cone. Okay. An ice cream cone. Cones aren't usually black, but... No, but isn't cotton candy usually taller, like blob, like more like that? Not to criticize your artwork, I mean, now that looks like... <laughs> Okay. No, no. You know what this looks like now? Um, it looks like one of those ice cream things you get from the ice cream truck. You oh, know? yeah. Like those um, um, ice cream bars on a stick. Yeah, the strawberry shortcake ones. Mm-hmm. Phenomenal. If you put a little, some white dots in it, I have a cool strawberry shortcake ice cream. Mm-hmm. Favorite childhood memory. Yes. Another thing they're missing out on these days ice cream trucks i know we had one it's just not the same because there's no kids outside playing they're inside going like this okay struck a nerve struck a nerve yeah that's it that's what they're doing they don't know what a swing set is they don't know what (sighs) what's that thing we used to play against the brick wall of school fastball Fast pitch. One man with a bat and one kid with a rubber ball, even a tennis ball, and you had a great afternoon. And you didn't have air conditioning, and you'd walk to the 7-Eleven to get a Slurpee, and life was good because Wendy Peppercorn was the lifeguard at the local pool, and we were going to go by there to cool off later. We weren't sitting inside with air conditioning and AirPods in our ears playing twitch switches in our hands. Dad, AirPods in your ears and this is what you have next to you? An AirPod box? Making fun of us. Which I wasn't using when I was playing pickup. All right, back to um, Julia Galef. So I I wanna play you a, a couple short clips and she's talking about here about the mindset that many people struggle with. She, she uses a metaphor of the soldier and the scout. Both are influential um, aspects of military warfare, uh, but she wants to use the soldier and the scout as a metaphor for how we think and how we view the world. And I think it's really powerful. And uh, I, hope, I hope you appreciate it as much as I do now. Why is it like that? I've got to go like this, and here we go. So here's the ten moment that you're. Ah, I should have done. Here we go. So I'd like you to imagine for a moment that you're a soldier in the heat of battle. Maybe you're a Roman foot soldier, or a medieval archer, or maybe you're a Zulu warrior. Regardless of your time and place. There are some things that are constant. Your adrenaline is elevated, and your actions are stemming from these deeply ingrained reflexes, reflexes rooted in a need to protect yourself and your side and to defeat the enemy. So now I'd like you to imagine playing a very different role, that of the scout. So the scout's job is not to attack or defend. The scout's job is to understand. The scout is the one going out, mapping the terrain, uh, identifying potential obstacles. And the scout may hope to learn that, say, there's a bridge in a convenient location across a river. But above all, the scout wants to know what's really there, as accurately as possible. And in a a real, actual army, uh, both the soldier and the scout are essential. But you can also think of each of these roles as uh, a mindset. 
a metaphor for how all of us process information and ideas in our daily lives. And what I'm going to argue today is that having good judgment, making accurate predictions,、uh, making good decisions, is mostly about which mindset you're in. So. To illustrate these mindsets in action, I'm going to take you back to 19th-century France, where this innocuous-looking piece of paper launched one of the biggest political scandals in history. So, from this point,、uh, she goes into、uh, what history calls the Dreyfus Affair, the scandal in the French army over espionage and over an innocent Jewish man. Being blamed、uh, for the espionage, really for no no real evidence. The evidence、um, wasn't there at all, and the lack of evidence in the mindset of the very anti-Semitic climate in the French army at the, that time led them to be convinced. Against cognitive dissonance, or with cognitive dissonance, that this innocent man was guilty. And so she she talks about that soldier mindset, how and how it worked itself out against Dreyfus. But she mentions the scout mindset. She goes through the Dreyfus affair as as a really powerful、um, illustration of how the difference between the soldier mindset and the scout mindset works. And then she comes. To a conclusion about this whole thing, and so I'm going to skip forward, and I'm going to recommend to you that you,、uh, and I'll link to this. I, I will link to the full TED talk. You know, TED talks have to be under 18 minutes. That's one of the rules for TED talks, and Julia does hers in 11 and a half. She's she's a brilliant, brilliant mind. But、um, so it's only eleven and a half minutes. You have to you have to donate,、uh, devote to yourself to pick up on this this theory of 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 mind. But I would suggest to you,、um, you probably can end up watching it a, a couple of different times, as as my wife and I did. So let's take up、uh, with Julia、uh, on the other side of the Dreyfus affair and see what she. Child for what I call scout mindset. It's the drive not to make one idea win or another lose, but just to see what's really there, as as honestly and accurately as you can, even if it's not pretty or convenient or pleasant. And this mindset is what I'm personally passionate about,、um, and what I've spent the last few years、uh, examining and and trying to figure out what causes scout mindset. You know, why are some people sometimes, at least, able to cut through their own prejudices and biases and motivations and just try to see the facts and the evidence as objectively as they can?、Uh, and the answer is emotional. So, just as soldier mindset is rooted in emotions like defensiveness or tribalism, scout mindset is too. It's just rooted in different emotions. So, for example, scouts are curious. They're more likely to say that they feel pleasure when they learn new information or an itch to solve a puzzle.、Um, they're more likely to feel intrigued when they encounter something that, that contradicts their expectations. Scouts also have different values. They're more likely to say that、uh, they think it's virtuous to test your own beliefs, and they're less likely to say that someone who changes his mind seems weak. And above all, scouts are grounded, which means that. Their self-worth as a person isn't tied to how right or wrong they are about any particular topic. So, you know, they can believe that capital punishment works, and if studies come out showing that it doesn't, they can say, "Huh, looks like I might be wrong. Doesn't mean I'm bad or stupid." You know. So these traits, this cluster of traits, is what researchers have found,、uh, and I've also found anecdotally, predicts good judgment. And the key takeaway I want to leave you with about Those traits is that they're primarily not about how smart you are or about how much you know.、Uh, in fact, they don't correlate very much with IQ at all.、Um, they're about how you feel. So there's a quote that I keep coming back to by Saint Exupéry. He's the author of The Little Prince, and he said, "If you want to build a ship, 
Don't drum up your men to collect wood and and give orders and distribute the work. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. In other words, I claim, if we want to really improve our judgment as as individuals and as societies, what we need most is not more instruction in logic or rhetoric or probability or economics, even though those things are quite valuable. Um, but what we most need to use those principles well is scout mindset. We need to change the way we feel. We need to learn how to feel proud instead of ashamed when we notice we might have been wrong about something. We need to learn how to feel intrigued instead of defensive when we encounter some information that contradicts、uh, our beliefs. So the question I want to leave you with is: What do you most yearn for? Do you yearn to defend your own beliefs, or do you yearn to see the world as clearly as you possibly can? Thank you. I'm going to play that in a moment. I'm going to play that last minute over again because I think it's so powerful. But a lot of people who you listen to. Who've gone through deconstruction? One of their biggest complaints、uh, about church or the faith they grew up in is that they weren't given a venue. They, they weren't given. Forgive me. I know a lot of people don't like this term, but a safe space to express their doubt or ask questions, hard questions. Um, or simple questions, because the mindset in the church is fortification Christianity, and that is if you're really asking questions, you're a doubting Thomas, and and your your faith is weak. You don't need to ask questions because we've already got all the answers. Here they are. We'll lay them out on the table for you.、Um, You know, when when you when the outside world, when the secular world asks the hard questions, we've got、uh, Norm Geisler has the answer for you, or Frank Turek, and just come to us, and you plug your umbilical cord into the giants of Christian thought, and you don't really need to think on your own. And and for the most part, this generation,、um, our children. Uh, and our children's children are growing up in a world where that's absurd, where that itself is a sign of weakness, where where they're suspicious of any group that basically says you don't have to think because we've done it for you, where they're not. They look at that as a con. They look at that as an email scam, like、uh, the prince in Nigeria who wants to send you a million dollars for no reason, or something like that, and and they're right to. To think that, because that's exactly what it is. That's fortification Christianity. That's insecurity. That's faith that's not built on, you know,、uh, evidence. That's that's faith that's built on fear and loathing and and guilt、uh, and, and a bunch of things that people are weighing and they're seeing in their the lives of the people in their church and they're seeing. And you know, Wendy and I listen to. Dozens of deconstruction stories,、um, and in the past few years, hundreds, if not thousands, of them. We listened to two this morning, and both、uh, the people who were who were expressing their deconversion or their deconstruction stories said the same thing. It's it's it, we keep hearing the same things over and over that they didn't see greater peace in the church. They they didn't see the fruit. Fruits of the spirit in the church, and they saw it outside of the church with people who don't have any affiliation,、um, and so there was this dissonance、um, playing there、uh, over the people who preached something that didn't live up to it, and over the people who didn't preach it and did.、Uh, they saw more Christ-like behavior outside their church experience than inside it, and so that's what began their exploration. Of maybe I'm wrong. They they saw a lack of humility in their church experience and a a, a depth of pride、um, that wasn't really based on、uh, any accomplishment, but it was based on what other people had passed down, traditions, and so forth. And and so the scientific method 
was not to be found there. Some, a method that's very respected by this generation, and that's a good thing. <laughs> that's not something um, that's anti-God at all, because God wrote the laws of nature. So, so here we have this conundrum. We, we have people who are actually exploring truth, and they're doing it um, with less baggage and less interference outside the church because they find when they bring these questions up in their youth group, they're shunned, you know, or shamed. Uh, when they bring it up in their family or with their pastors, they, they're they looked upon with suspicion and not with compassion. Um, so this idea of the, the scout mindset, that this is what we want to really have, it's just, it's just intellectual honesty. It's absolutely... The truth doesn't need to be shrouded uh, with lies and uh, with ghost stories to keep people in Plato's cave. It doesn't. God is not that fragile. God's word is not that fragile. Religion is, uh, especially um, aspects of the Christian religion. Uh, so never fear if your children are exploring truth and they walk away. Um, in that exploration because if you really believe that God is truth and that Jesus is the way the truth and the life then you shouldn't you shouldn't lose your mind over your child walking away for a season if they're if they're sincere in their in their journey because they're just winding around the mountain and they're going to come closer to home as they explore truth it's the Christians I find who are insecure in their faith who have doubts themselves that they try and stifle because they don't want to articulate it. They don't want to think about it because it, it would cost them too much to follow that rabbit down the hole. It would cost them relationships or business or peace of mind. Uh, and so they deem that the truth is too high a cost to pay. And so they really... Um, are in a sense of cognitive dissonance and it's 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 not fulfilling to live that way it's a stewing misery that happens like it's like with somebody who's in a bad relationship who's it maybe is a battered wife in an abusive relationship and they don't want to rock the boat <laughs> you know because they want to they're even the even though the status quo is miserable it's preferable to the unknown for, for them in, in this toxic state. So I want to talk to the parents out there who are freaking out that their kids are going through deconstruction or possibly a wife who's freaking out that her husband is or her husband that her wife is, is going through this. The worst thing you can do is to try to fortify the status quo with ghost stories and try to shame them or shun them back into the fold. I mean, they're not going to be happy there. I mean, once you, once you get a glimpse outside the cave, uh, the shadows are just not substantial for you. They're just not. Um, and they become a prisoner in their own mind if they, if they get back into the fold. But that shouldn't be your goal as a parent as a spouse, as, as a neighbor, as a friend. Um, and as somebody who really has respect for God and the truth of God, um, your face shouldn't be so fragile. Let's play that last minute again. Again, this is Penn State University. About five years ago, Julia Galef is speaking uh, about the soldier and scout mindset. In other words, I claim, if we want to really improve our judgment as, as individuals and as societies, what we need most is not more instruction in logic or rhetoric or probability or economics, even though those things are quite valuable. Um, but what we most need to use those principles well is scout mindset. We need to change the way we feel. We need to learn how to feel proud instead of ashamed when we notice we might have been wrong about something. We need to learn how to feel intrigued instead of defensive when we encounter some information that contradicts uh, our beliefs. So the question I want to leave you with is, what do you most yearn for? Do you yearn to defend your own beliefs? 
or do you yearn to see the world as clearly as you possibly can? Thank you. Eleven and a half minutes um, of exceptional insight, Julia Galef. Archibald MacLeish, uh, a brilliant mind himself, once quipped that religion, at its best, when it makes us is is at its best, when it makes us ask hard questions of ourselves. It is at its worst when it deludes us into thinking we have all the answers for everybody else. Archibald McLeish. Religion is at its best when it makes us ask hard questions of ourselves. That's a robust, intellectually honest faith. It is at its worst when it deludes us into thinking we have all the answers for everyone else. That is a pride-filled faith. George MacDonald, um, C.S. Lewis's mentor, if you would, one of his spiritual mentors, said, I am so tired by the things said about God. I understand God's patience with the wicked, right, with the uh, lost with the unsaved in some of the evangelical vernacular you might be familiar with. I understand God's patience with the wicked, but I do wonder how he can be so patient with the pious. We've done a full circle now, and you see that Jesus Christ was more patient with the outcasts and the broken than he was with the high priests and Caiaphas, uh, the theologians, the law doctors, uh, the uh, shepherds, the worthless shepherds of his day. He was compassionate upon the sheep who were being led by worthless shepherds. And this is something that we need to grapple with because in, in America today, we have a gaggle of worthless shepherds and uh, it's affecting us now. We, we've, we've hit the wall, so to speak. Uh, it has come out as the church is, is broken. And our children look at it and they see it broken. My wife said to me today, she said, it always bothered me that, you know, I, everywhere you turn, you see churches splitting and you see Christians bickering over meaningless things. And you, you, you really wonder, is this, is, you know, is what's wrong in this situation, right? And the moment you stop taking account of yourself, the moment you stop saying, well, what if I'm wrong? Or what if they're right? The moment you, uh, you fortify this idea of an us and a them, something that Christ came to smash, to smash the patriarchy uh, in, in the body of Christ. There's no male and female. To smash the statism, uh, the racism. You know, there's no Jew and Greek. Um, Jesus Christ was a revolutionary. He wasn't a party man. Christianity in America today has become a party spirit. It is a partisan movement. It is not interested in defeating the enemy by making them our friends or loving our enemies. It's more interested in crushing our enemies and defeating them. It, Christianity is more enticed by the violence in the Old Testament and, and driving the wicked out of Canaan uh, to take it for God than it is to stoop down with a towel and a bowl and to wash the feet of the Judas in our midst, to carry the pack of the oppressor the extra mile, to turn the other cheek to the person who's hostile to us, to pray for those who are persecuting us. Can you imagine, and this is our subject for next Sunday, can you imagine what the world would look like 
if we responded to the red letter words of the blue collar worker? What would the world look like if Christians actually did reflect Christ or honor him in our word, our thoughts and our deeds by transforming ourselves first with his mind, his mindset, his attitude? What a different world it would look. It would, uh, we'd be viewed as by our fellow man, by our children even, who are leaving the church because they're not seeing love, joy, patience, long-suffering. Uh, they're just not seeing that. They're seeing the opposite of that. They're seeing judgmentalism and hypocrisy and insecurity and fear. And like the dog who can smell fear, our children have a... As, as beings created in the image of God, they have a radar that is set to understand what is right and what is just. And when they're not seeing righteousness and justice, uh, with the Caiaphases of our day who man our pulpits, who um, lead our Jericho marches, who are in bed with politicians, then they're right to question the status quo. They're right to overturn the tables of the money changers. Holy cow. Are we ready to come to you? Because that looks amazing. I'm, I'm actually hungry right now. And that might be the best one. You know what else I like? A creamsicle. And you could make a creamsicle with those two. But can we show them what you got so far? Because uh, I'm just about there. Now, remember, we only have the one camera today. So let me, let me hold this one up. This is our strawberry is shortcake. Favorite? I don't know why ice cream's on your mind. I know why. Tell we them about our daddy, yesterday. daughter, mommy date yesterday. Yesterday we went, on a, um, we went to the mall and we got ice cream. And Creamistry. the day before... Wait, we... wait, wait, wait. What? Well, not just ice cream. We got Creamistry, which is nitrogen, frozen nitrogen made ice cream. And we got Captain Crunch. It had Captain Crunch cereal mixed in it. It's like little baby crunchy angels. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. It goes perfect together. It does. Stra ice cream and Captain Crunch. Strawberry shortcake. Mm -hmm. That's um, $2 now. It was like a quarter when I was a kid. Two dollars. Okay, go ahead. This one has a real stick. This one has a real stick. A and toothpick. <laughs> this one looks good. It's like a sherbet kind of thing. Is that right? It's like a sherbet flavor. And then what else you got? I'm still making more ice creams, but um, this looks real to me, kind of. Like it's a ice cream sandwich. It actually has those dots around it, some. Like it those does. Little holes. It, you can't see it because... I'd have to put it on my head because I'm focused, but it's not focused when I go up here. I'll take a picture of these. These look incredible. Ice cream sandwich. Who didn't love an ice cream sandwich? And after the show, when, uh, Wendy, Peyton's going to make a creamsicle. Hold up those two. People know what a creamsicle looks like. You know, the orange and white, delicious creamsicle. We'll come to it later. Folks, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope I'm prying your brain open just to think differently. This is not, this is, my father used to call his church the unchurch. And there was a sense that was very true. Well, we're, I guess, not a church, but we're a church without walls. We've blown the walls open. We, we invite everyone who comes in well, peace. we are in a house, but. We're in a house, but the walls are metaphorical, okay. right? So, um, the foundation is Christ. Um, the roof is hospitality. We love you no matter how you think or how you identify. None, done, atheist, agnostic, Muslim, Jainist, Hindu, Baha'i, Zoroastrian, um, worshiper of the flying spaghetti monster, wherever you find yourself, fellow Christian, deconstructing Christian, ex-evangelical, wherever you are in your journey in the path on your life we welcome you to break bread with us to come 
and reason together. And we'll see you next week.